the outcome will lay the foundation for the modern world. Greeks uh, traditionally called everybody except themselves barbarians. So this whole thing really uh, between East and West started probably with the Persians and the Greeks and continued ever since. The Persian invasion of Greece would be one of the greatest collaborations of strategy and engineering in military history. The massive invasion would be a complex land-sea assault demanding some astonishing feats of engineering. Xerxes wanted his forces to enter Greece at the Isthmus of Mount Athos, but the seas there were so turbulent, the king directed his builders to dig a canal across the isthmus. With vast manpower and expertise in canal engineering, Xerxes' engineers took a mere six months to complete the canal across the isthmus. But the next challenge facing his generals and architects was even greater. The huge Persian army still had to cross the one and a half mile wide Hellespont. To this day, their solution is considered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever conceived for a military campaign. Borrowing a page from his father's book, Xerxes ordered a double pontoon bridge built across the Hellespont, a feat of engineering that would far surpass the bridge Darius built at the Bosporus. But what's very interesting is that 674 ships were now lined up how were these ships kept stable? This must have been quite an engineering feat. The Bosphorus is not a very calm area. It can be quite choppy. The row of ships were kept in place with a very taut system of cables, probably two large cables that ran between Asia and Europe. Now remember, a large number of troops crossed this bridge, perhaps up to 240,000 troops. The ropes allowed the boat sufficient flexibility of movement in the turbulent waters. Each section of the bridge was built on two boats connected by planks, so the entire roadway could ride the waves, absorbing much of the surface choppiness. Persian engineers then constructed a platform across the top of the boats, then the roadway on top of that. With each wood plank, a superhighway emerged crossing the Hellespont using battleships as the foundation. Remember, we're dealing with the hooves of tens of thousands of cavalry, including armored cavalry, which would have been much, much heavier. The ships were amazingly kept stable, so this allowed Xerxes to cross with his army into Europe and cross back when he needed to, and the ships were kept in place. And for a short period, Europe and Asia were one. Ten days later, with his bridge complete, Xerxes marched into Europe. The whole army crossed with heavy equipment, heavy cavalry, and the planks were kept in place. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. Xerxes' strategy was simple. Overwhelm the Greeks on land and at sea with superior numbers. Once again, the Greeks were led by the great general Themistocles. He knew he couldn't beat Xerxes on land, so the entire campaign was designed to lure the Persian navy into a trap. In August of 480 BC, the two armies met at a spot chosen by the Greeks, Thermopylae, a mountain pass so narrow only one chariot at a time could get through. For days, the massive Persian army was stalled, bottlenecked on the wrong side of the pass, just as the Greeks planned. In the meantime, unseen by the Persians, Themistocles left with most of his army, leaving only a token force of 6,000 Spartans behind. Like his father before him, Xerxes was about to charge headlong into a Greek trap. When they finally broke through the narrow pass, the Persians easily destroyed the meager Spartan force Themistocles had left behind as bait and marched toward Athens. But when Xerxes reached the city, Athens was deserted. Xerxes suspected he had been duped and would make the Athenian people pay for it. 
For generations, tolerance for their vanquished had been the hallmark of Persian kings. Not this time. In a very un-Persian-like act, Xerxes burnt Athens to the ground. The Persian king regretted it immediately, and the following morning ordered Athens rebuilt. But it was too late. The deed was done. His moment of rage would come back to haunt Persia nearly 200 years later. But this war was still far from over. At the same time, Themistocles was setting his trap that lured the massive Persian navy into the narrow bay at Salamis. Then he unleashed a surprise attack. The huge Persian fleet was caught in the naval equivalent of gridlock. They couldn't maneuver in the tiny bay. While the Greeks used their heavy triremes as battering rams to demolish the Persian ships. It was a decisive victory for the Greeks. Xerxes returned home defeated, king of a Persian empire that was no longer invincible. There is one high note in the Persian loss against the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis, one saving grace, a woman named Artemisia, the sole female Navy captain in the Persian fleet. She faked out the Greeks by ramming one of her own losing ships, and she sailed away to escape in the confusion. Her survival skills so impressed Xerxes that he was thought to have said, my men are becoming women, and my women are becoming men. The Persian Wars launched Athens into its golden age, but left the colossal Persian Empire vulnerable. It would be left to a young prince, a worshiper of Persia's great kings, to deal the empire its last blow. Humiliated by Artemisia's daring escape, the Greeks offered a huge price for her capture, but Artemisia had safely sailed home. BC, the Greeks had defeated the Persian fleet at Thermopylae. The aura of invincibility that surrounded this empire was gone. But there were still days of power and glory ahead for the Persian Empire. Fifteen years later, in 465 BC, the Persian king Xerxes died. Xerxes left the empire to his son, Artaxerxes who was determined to take Persia back to its golden days. He began by turning his attention to a building project begun by his grandfather, Darius. Four decades after it was started, Persepolis, the magnificent capital city, was still under construction. Now Artaxerxes would oversee one of the last great engineering projects of the Persian Empire. Today we know it as the remarkable hall of a hundred columns. We know that the actual hall was some 200 by 200 feet, almost on the perfect square. But what's remarkable of the Persepolis columns is when you look up uh, the entire shaft, and these things raise, you know, hundreds of feet into, into the air, there is not one piece of displacement whatsoever. It's a perfect, perfect vertical. They're working with what we might consider to be primitive tools, just stone mallets and bronze chisels, that's all. The fluting on the columns of Persepolis is so precise, however, that these are clearly the work of master craftsmen. The columns are constructed in drums, seven or eight drums stacked on top of another. This is done by scaffolding the whole area around the column and then with a crane, a wooden crane, literally moving each column drum in place. Any client king, any governor from a distance, or even anyone who would come in that hall would be so impressed by the vastness of the hall and by this forest of columns that stretched nearly as far as the eye could see. An amazing achievement. Across the empire, Persians were still producing some of the most extraordinary feats of engineering in the ancient world. In 353 BC, the wife of a local governor began work on a magnificent tomb for her dying husband. Her tribute to him would be a marvel of engineering and would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world.